Bless your hearts for braving the weather and giving priority to the evening. Are you glad you came? Six of you? I'm glad you came. <laughs> and thank you, Marcus, for that reminder. I get teary eyes every time I hear that. I was a bus kid. I still remember, as I told you the other evening, when that old yellow Ford bus pulled up beside the house and honked the horn. Where would I be tonight without the Lord Jesus and a bus driver and a Sunday school teacher? You know, that's something worth thinking about. Where would you be tonight without the Lord Jesus in your life? Aren't you glad for the day you heard the good news? Sometimes, somewhere, you heard about Jesus, his death and burial and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit drew you to himself. Jesus said in the Gospels, No man comes to me except my Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up in the last day. Aren't you glad? For the loving, wooing, drawing, tender work of God in your heart. And so here we are in church on a Tuesday night. Principally influenced by that time when we met the Lord. Let's pause right now and invite him to speak to our hearts. Father, we love you and we love these people. We ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us from the scriptures. We're back in church tonight because we want to continue to mature and grow and advance and learn. Be tutored by your Spirit and take some fresh steps forward in our relationship with you. Amen. Help me one more time with the infilling of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bill was born in 1910. He was the son of an alcoholic father. Bill's mom would actually lie for her husband when he was too drunk to get up and go to work. Bill grew up one of six children in what authors would describe these days as a dysfunctional family. You all familiar with that term? Anybody know who thought that word up? You don't? Neither do I. I remember when maladjusted was in style. Anybody remember that term? Please raise your hand. In case you hadn't heard, maladjusted's out of style. Dysfunctional's in style now. You know, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't know those fancy words. We were just messed up big time. But Bill grew up in what they described today as a dysfunctional family. About age 18, he left home, got married. And in the first year or two of that marriage, he and his wife had a baby boy. But before that boy was even three years old, Bill's wife died. Bill married a second time. And in the first year of that second marriage, Bill and his second wife had a baby boy. But before that second baby boy was even one year old, Bill's second wife died. Left him less than 30 years of age with two baby boys. Then Bill met Edith. She was born in 1922, 12 years younger than Bill. She had her own history of scars and abuse and wounds and victimizations. She was her mom and dad's firstborn. But in her early childhood, her mom and dad split up and had a divorce. Pretty soon the depression hit. And times were hard and jobs were scarce and money was rare. Although she really didn't want to do it, it seemed like the best option available to Edith's mom was to put the little girl in the orphanage. So Edith spent early childhood through early adolescence bouncing back and forth between the orphanage and the home of an abusive aunt in a nearby town. 
Later, Edith's mom remarried, and she had children from her second husband. By the time Edith was finished in high school, she was reintroduced back in her mom's household. Although she was the oldest, she was an outsider, and she was unwanted. And she was subjected to verbal abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse and the sexual abuse from her stepdad. Bill and Edith got acquainted. And as far as Edith could tell, Bill, with his two baby boys, was a whole lot better deal than the abusive context of her mom's household. So Bill and Edith got married. And they did the only thing they knew how to do. They continued to live in a vulgar, violent, mean, raw, ugly, abusive, dysfunctional family. I am Bill and Edith's third child. I grew up in a home where there was verbal abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse and sexual abuse. How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse? Authors these days are explaining it solidifies internally in our emotions and forms what they have termed toxic shame. Whoa, what in the world's that? It um, gives you a miserably low self esteem, it's differentiated from healthy shame. What's that? Healthy shame is a God-planted conscience in your heart that turns on when you do something bad or wrong. Healthy shame was functioning quite well when as a schoolboy I stole a candy bar from the corner drugstore. The God-planted conscience in my heart turned on and said, Norman, what you did was bad and wrong. Thank God for a conscience, healthy shame. It tells us what you did was bad and wrong. You know, as crazy as this world is, just think what it would be like if God hadn't given us all a conscience, healthy shame to thwart and retard wrong behavior. While healthy shame says what you did was bad and wrong, toxic shame says you were bad and wrong. Left me with a miserably low self-esteem. How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse? It's result in toxic shame. It manifests itself later in self-sabotaging, sinful, defeating, wounding behaviors. You ever known an alcoholic? Drinking one after the other after the other all day long, that's all they do. What are they saying? Delicious? My life's ambition is to set a new record in my state for drunk driving charges? I don't think so. I think they're saying I'm miserable and I'm frustrated, but I found this stuff to temporarily take my mind off how bad I hurt. It's just one of several options to select some external substance to distract us from unresolved internal pain. Do you ever know a chain smoker? Lighting one after the other after the other all day long, that's all they do. What are they saying? Delicious? Better than ice cream? I don't think so. I think they're saying I am miserable and I'm frustrated. But I found this adult pacifier to temporarily nurse me into distraction and take my mind off of how bad I hurt. It's just another example of finding some external substance to distract from unresolved internal pain. Do you ever know a drug addict doing heroin, cocaine, marijuana, the pills, crack, whatever? They're saying the same thing in a different way. I am miserable, and I'm frustrated. But I found this stuff to temporarily take my mind off of how bad I hurt. Here's another one, a little bit less severe. Have you ever heard of food addiction? Did you ever catch yourself looking inside a refrigerator 10 minutes after dinner? And you caught yourself and said, what in the world am I doing here? I don't mind disclosing to you, friends. When I'm out on the road away from my wife and daughter and granddaughter, son-in-law, after the eating service, get back to my room, predictably about 10 o'clock at night, I'm overcome with an enormous urge 
to eat everything chocolate in the whole town. A couple of towns I almost succeeded. It's just another example of finding some external substance to distract from unresolved internal pain. Here's another one. You ever heard of shopaholism? Did you know there's some folks who can't get through the day without going to the mall? They're hooked on their plastic charge cards. Sometimes, I know, not always, but sometimes the internal motivation is, I don't know what I'm looking for. But it might be on sale. It might give me a bit of a boost because down inside they feel like a double zero. They're thinking mistakenly, if I can uh, find some materialistic acquisition, it might plug the hole in my empty emotional bucket. Here's another one. You ever known a workaholic? Bad thing about that malady, current society congratulates such unhealthy behavior. Ever heard anybody described, boy, he is a hard worker. Okay, wonderful. But in how many instances are there dads and husbands, neglected wife and kids, burning the candle at both ends, mistakenly thinking, if I really hit it hard and make it to the top and hit the big time, then someday I'll be good enough for the pat on the head or the tweak on the cheek or the two thumbs up or I'm proud of you, that affirmation that's so absent and will never be there from some critical perfectionistic authority figure and their vulnerable young yesterday. Here's another one. How many American men right this minute are privately and secretly hooked on pornography and its accompanying sexual compulsive and addictive behaviors? How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse, toxic shame, and the multiple manifestations of sinful, defeating, wounding behavior? Three scriptures to review. Three statements to remember. Face it. That means quit living in denial. Whatever happened, happened. Forgive it. Realize that's a process, not a quick fix. And forge ahead. Take responsibility for your own life and your behavior. Change lanes and go around the wreck of the past. Step on the gas. Get on down the road. Amen. And watch the mess of the yesterday shrink in your rearview mirror. Yes. First scripture tonight is Romans chapter 8 at verse 26. Eighth chapter Romans. 26th verse. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. What then should we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Would you, dear friends, like some good news this Tuesday night? On the authority of God's Word. He is for you! But how do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse? and its result in toxic shame. Face it! Quit living in denial. 
But face it in view of the Scriptures. You don't have to face it alone. God is for you. Verse 26, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Later in Romans, it says, Jesus Christ, God's Son, is seated at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing? He's also making intercession for you. That word intercede means appeal to the Father on your behalf. And verse 28 says, God himself causes, that means laser-focused energy expended by God on your behalf resulting in all things coming together for good. How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse? Face it, whatever happened, happened. Whatever's there is there. Whatever went down, went down. You can't rewind it and make it play back something else. Quit living in denial. But you don't have to face it alone. The Holy Spirit resident in your heart intercedes for you. And Jesus at the right hand of the Father also makes intercession. And God the Father himself spends energy focused on your personal benefit, resulting in all things, even the context of your past woundedness and victimization. And bring it together for good, if indeed you love him and are called according to his purpose. How about you? Was there physical abuse? Was there emotional abuse? Was there verbal abuse? Was there sexual abuse? Here's another one. Was there religious abuse? What's that? Any teaching or preaching that's unbiblical constitutes religious abuse whether it's extreme, right-wing, hyper-conservative, perfectionistic legalism that skews your concept of God and leaves you to mistakenly conclude he's some mean, irritable grouch who's impossible to please, who puts you on some tedious treadmill of performance-oriented religion that becomes nothing more than salvation by works. Or the opposite brain-dead error, a left-wing liberal worldliness that rationalizes God as love so anything goes, y'all have a good time. Any teaching or preaching that's unbiblical constitutes a religious abuse. How do you handle it? Face it. Quit living in denial. Whatever happened, happened. And perhaps one of the most healthy things for somebody to do tonight before you walk out the door is to pause and bow and admit to yourself and admit to God, I'm really mad about what he did about what she did, about how I was wounded and scarred and harmed and stepped on and run over and victimized by that hurtful perpetrator. But once we face it, we need to forgive it. Paul helps us again, this time from Ephesians chapter 4. At verse 31. At Ephesians 4, 31, Paul writes, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. At verse 32, he tells us how we are to forgive. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. How? Just as in Christ God forgave you. I looked that up. You know what that means? Just as in Christ God forgave you. It means exact same quantitative and qualitative way that God wrote off your transgressions through the shed blood of Jesus on Calvary in the same quantitative and qualitative way you and I are to write off the transgressions of those perpetrated against us. And if you made a list of your sins against God and other folks' sins against you, I wonder which list would be longer. 
How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse? Face it. Quit living in denial and then forgive it. But realize that's a process, not a quick fix. I would politely debate anybody who would insist that forgiveness is instantaneous quick fix, especially with these heavy issues. They didn't accumulate overnight. They don't dissipate overnight. It's not a five-second microwave oven quick zap kind of a deal. It's a slow simmer all day long crock pot kind of deal. But we have a problem. We live in a very impulsive and impatient age. We like fast food from a drive up window. We like instant cash out of a bank teller machine. We like microwave popcorn. And even in church, we're preconditioned 20 seconds and two Kleenex at the altar and everything's fixed. We all live happily ever after. Well, this stuff didn't accumulate overnight. It doesn't dissipate overnight. Forgiveness on these issues is not a quick fix. It's a process. I mean, do you have any idea how I felt? I was saved, I told you already this week, as a bus kid, age 11, from a abusive, dysfunctional family, an unchurched home, rode the Sunday school bus. And I was doing the best I know how to be a born-again, spirit-filled, sanctified, dedicated disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I remember when I was 13, 7th grade, Risley Junior High School, Pueblo, Colorado, when I had four flat tires, spiritually, all at once. I went up to the P.E. coach and I, coach and I bent over and coughed. <coughs> oh, Coach, I'm sorry. I can't suit up for gym today. I think I got the flu. When the truth was, I was just faking it. Truth was, I didn't want to suit up in the locker room and put on gym shorts and a T-shirt in front of all the other classmates and have them see the belt stripes everywhere from the whip in the night before. Can I testify for a second? The Lord has escorted me all the way from an initial location of white-hot anger to a current posture of no hard feelings. It's over. It's forgiven. It's history. They did the best they could for who they were and what they knew. I've got to ask you something. Is there somebody... You need to forgive in your yesterdays, maybe your current day. You and I cannot afford the luxury of a grudge. You might be thinking, but you don't know what they did. I don't have a clue what they did. You don't know how bad I was hurt. I'm so sorry you were hurt. You don't know how long it lasted. No, it's really none of my business. But I do know Jesus said to forgive 70 times 7 and turn the other cheek and vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Is there somebody you need to forgive? We have another problem. We like quick fixes. We're impulsive. We don't like pain and discomfort. We want it to go away quickly. But these issues don't dissipate immediately. I kind of think it's like pulling the plug in the bathtub, this issue of forgiveness. Did you ever watch the water leave the tub when you pulled out the plug? You have. My, you have an exciting life. Anybody got a plug so big and a drain so wide, the water all just immediately dissipates, wham, there it goes. Now, wouldn't that be a plumber's nightmare? No, you pull the plug and the water swirls. It circles, it gurgles, but an inch at a time, that dirty old bathwater subsides and dissipates. Maybe tonight would be a good time for somebody to pull the plug and let forgiveness begin. How do you handle the negative effects of chronic abuse that's result in toxic shame? Face it, quit living in denial. Forgive it, but realize that's a process, not a quick fix. Maybe it would be a good prayer for somebody to say, Father, I'm ready 
tonight to begin the process to start forgiveness. But once you face it and get forgiveness in process, we need to forge ahead. We can't park where you are. And in Philippians, one more time, Paul helps us with his writings. At chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul had some negatives in his background, but he chose a positive attitude, a proactive posture. And he chose not to let the problems of the past sink his boat for the future. And it's a great example for us here right now. Philippians 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The good news is you're not stuck where you've been. You've got an option. You can face it and you can forgive it and you can forge ahead. And by forge ahead, I mean change lanes. Go around the wreck of the past. Step on the gas. Put the pedal to the metal and get on down the road and watch the mess of the yesterdays shrink in your rearview mirror. The good news of the evening is you're not stuck where you've been. You've got options. You and I cannot afford to spend the rest of our lives blaming all of our sins and habits and hang-ups on some abusive perpetrator in our vulnerable yesterdays. Sooner or later, we need to face reality, get forgiveness and process, and take responsibility for our own future. You and I can't always control what happens to us, but we are responsible for our reactions and choices following what happens to us. I mean, imagine a guy was a half million dollars in delinquent debt. And he came to church and he heard God's word preached and he went to the altar and he was saved and sanctified in the biblical sense of those terms. When he'd go home, he'd be a saved and sanctified man who was a half million dollars in delinquent debt. He still had a problem to work on. And if a bus kid from an unchurched home who'd been run over by a truck emotionally got on an old yellow bus and was hauled to Sunday school, heard God's word preached, went to the altar, was saved and sanctified. When he'd get up and go home, he'd be a saved and sanctified boy who'd been run over by a truck emotionally. He still got a problem to work on i got to tell you something. If the Lord do it for me, He'd sure enough do it for you. Is there somebody you need to forgive? Tonight could be the time when you turn a corner and head in a new direction and choose to face it and to forgive it and to forge ahead. You ever seen a stray dog from a distance? limping around on three legs, holding up a right front paw, just hobbling, getting around the best he could. You were too far to help it or do anything, but just driving by, you got the impression, oh, man, that dog been hurt. Evidently, nobody cared about it, took it to the vet to have it fixed or helped. It was just limping around on three legs, holding up a right front paw. I'm afraid there's folks like that in the church. Been run over a long time ago. They're saved, sure enough, sanctified, no doubt about it. They pay their tithe, they teach a class, they sing, and they show up, and they're loyal and dependable and dedicated and committed. They even subscribe to holiness today. But they've been run over a long time ago. And they're just limping around the best they know how. I'm here tonight to tell you some good news. You can face it, and you can forgive it, and you can forge ahead. I put my whole testimony in a poem. I call it, face it, forgive it, and forge ahead. For some of us in our past, there's pain and much abuse. The hurt is great and the scars are deep, and we wonder, what's the use? 
as anger boils down deep inside from suffering in our past, sometimes we react in harmful ways, needing victory that will last. We read and pray and seek advice, trying hard to cope. How do we handle our abusive past? Is there any hope? Face it, forgive it, and forge ahead. His spirit comes to say, we can recover from old hurts and enter a brand new day. To face the hurt and forgive the wrongs is not an easy task. But only then can we forge ahead to real victory that will last. The good news of the evening is you're not stuck where you've been. You've got options. You can face it, but you don't have to face it alone. God is for you. You can forgive it, but realize that's a process, not a quick fix. But you've got to pull the plug sometime. No better time than now. No better place than here. And then you can choose to forge ahead. You can't sit on the curb and pout and feel sorry for yourself, stare at the gutter while the whole parade goes down Main Street, blaming everything on abusers of the past. Sooner or later, we need to merge on into the life's parade and participate wholeheartedly and let the past shrink in a rearview mirror. There's a favorite, well-loved gospel song. It speaks well to the issue at hand. What a friend we have in Jesus. Would you please stand? Mark is going to help us sing along if you want. And for those of you who need to, those of you who need to,